I'd like to echo what was just said about the liveliness um, and of the discussion that took place in the, in the last session. Um, I think it's a really big testament to the vibrancy of the student movement at the moment and how important actually those uh, encampments and other forms of action that are taking place. It creates a space in which we can discuss all these things, not just among relatively small groups of people on the revolutionary left, but actually to reach a really much bigger audience. And we can also work with um, Palestinian comrades, with comrades from elsewhere in the, uh, in, in, in the Middle East to discuss and learn from each other. Um, because basically that is where a place that I, I wanted to start. Um, is that what I have learned about the struggles of people in, in the region, I've learned through discussion with people from the region and by participating in movements in solidarity with their action, I see that the transformation that is going to take place is something that will come um, from below in, 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 in the Middle East itself um, and will break apart, in fact, this even conception of that there is a thing called the Middle East, which is, as an idea, a thoroughly colonial um, construct. Um, and I do hope that other comrades you know, in the, in the room will speak in the discussion and bring in their, their perspectives. Um, I don't want to put them on the spot too much, but Ramses, I know, has been thinking about a lot of these questions as a Palestinian activist um, and you know, bringing that experience from the Palestinian movement into this discussion. So basically in this session, what I want to do, and I hope I won't um, you know, go take, take too long in the introduction so we can get into the discussion, is to pose two questions. The first question is really what has the dispossession and oppression of the Palestinians as a people got to do with the exploitation of workers as a class and the accumulation of, of capital, the way that capitalism works in the region, what has that got to do with the national oppression of the Palestinian people? So that's one question that I want to put on the table and to outline some arguments uh, around, uh, around that. As it will be no surprise, I think, to people that I'm going to argue that it's very deeply connected and then secondly, I want to ask, where does the power to change the situation that we see um, for the Palestinians, one of ongoing apartheid, occupation and genocide, where does that power lie? And I'm going to argue that the answers to these two questions are very much linked, because I would say that the national oppression of the Palestinians is structured into the way that capitalism works in the region. It's a historical, that's a historical fact that the way that capitalism has developed in the region has not just included the national oppression of the Palestinians as a sort of accidental byproduct, but it's become very, very central to the way that capitalism works in, in the region and the, the, the way that in, in, in imperialism works in the region. And this is why fundamentally the question of workers' agency in changing this situation, I would argue, is, is crucial. So the first point that I want to then therefore start, start with is to look in a little bit of detail about what the specific nature of the Israeli state and the, the nature of occupation, apartheid um, system that has oppressed the Palestinians for, for many decades, since before the foundation of the Israeli state, since the, um, uh, since the, the, the first development really of the Zionist settler colony in, in, in Palestine. Um, what is it that that process has done to, um, the, to Palestinian society? The, the first thing to say is that there's always been, I think, in the settler colonial project in um, in Palestine, a, a, an oscillation between two types of, uh, of strategy. One of which has been obviously about dispossession and exclusion of, um, of, of Palestinians from their own land. Um, and that is something that it has in common with other examples of settler colonial, settler, settler colonial projects. But there's also been in a very unstable relationship with that, um, that exclusion and dispossession um, and the kind of genocidal actually tendencies as well that you see uh, um, being on display in the, in the atrocities in, in, in Gaza. Another strategy, a complementary strategy, which is the one which is more like a, a form of apartheid, 
where actually Palestinians are dispossessed but also turned into um, a layer of a working class within historic Palestine, which is you know, bereft of, uh, of, many, of many rights and becomes a, 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 popul a subject population rather than a population of, uh, of citizens. That there have been for many decades it, over the history of the, Israeli, of the Israeli state, periods when the exploitation of Palestinian labor has also played an important role in the, uh, in the economy of the, um, uh, 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 of the, of the Zionist state. Why is that oscillation between these two strategies important? Because I think historically it has created um, a situation which you know we can see the logic of that playing out today. It's been a very um, unstable formation that has uh, that has resulted, where you have um, a, a, a Palestinian um, a, a Palestinian majority in the. A, 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 a very narrow majority in terms of population and demographic terms across the whole of historic Palestine. Um, but it's one that's compartmentalized and fragmented into many different cantons and areas in the West Bank. The West Bank itself is fragmented into a huge number of smaller areas. You know, the West Bank is cut off from, uh, from Gaza. And at points when there isn't a, a massive military assault, Going on, there is always a, there is a there there is a tendency among some sections of the Israeli uh, ruling class to want to keep those those areas functioning as kind of labour reserves. So in a sense, they do and have played, uh, say for example, the construction industry in Israel inside 48 Palestine um, has historically relied a lot on the labour of Palestinians from the West Bank. Historically, previously, it did rely quite a lot of labour of Palestinians from Gaza. That has been shut off for the last 16, 17 years through the imposition of the siege on Gaza. But during you know, previous decades, Gaza functioned as a labour labour reserve for parts of uh, uh, for for Tel Aviv as a city, for example, not just in construction but also in areas like hotels and catering and so on and so forth. And of course, there is also importantly the Palestinian working class inside 48 Palestine, who are citizens of, uh, citizens of Israel, and also form a, uh, an important layer of the, of the working class there who play a, a, a role in, for example, working in public transport, the health service, and so on and so forth. And we saw, actually, the potential power of the combination of workers' action across historic Palestine recently on display in May 2021 during the Unity Intifada when you had Palestinian workers in the West Bank not going um, to, to work inside 48 Palestine. You had call for a general strike inside 48 Palestine, which mobilized a very, quite relatively large numbers of Palestinians, um, particularly kind of in, again, public transport and health and so on. But the problem, and this is the, this is the, the, the difficulty that the nature of the Israeli state has, um, has created for Palestinians looking to exercise that kind of strategy of um, building a mass movement that relies on workers being the overwhelming majority in, in society, is that the exclusionary parts of the settler colonial project, the, the way in which Palestinians have been physically removed from large parts of historic Palestine in order to create this enclave society and economy which is exclusively Jewish, um, or at least the people in it who have rights as citizens are exclusively Jewish. Of course, there is an another section of the working class inside 48 Palestine which is neither Palestinian nor Jewish Israeli, but is in fact uh, migrant workers from many other countries in the world who also are treated as disposable labor by the, uh, by, 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 by the, the Israeli ruling class. Um, but the problem is that the exclusion of Palestinians from parts of the Israeli economy has left this situation where there is, you can't rely on that kind of overwhelming, being an overwhelming majority in society. This is particularly important, I would argue, is that the, uh, the most dynamic bits of the Israeli economy, the parts that in fact the Israeli ruling class as a, you know, has come to rely on to be the motor of economic development 
uh, particularly the high-tech industry, high-tech manufacturing, the outgrowths from the, um, basically from the US military industrial complex, the, um, you know, like software services, um, it, data infrastructures, uh, high-tech medical um, manufacturing and so on. Our Palestinians are almost entirely excluded from those from those sectors, and in fact, Palestinians are the are the, the targets of many of those products, particularly the ones that are, of course, related to policing, surveillance, military uh, military use, and uh, and so on and so forth. Um, this is this this is this is important because it gives the Israeli state and it gives the Israeli ruling class has historically had a degree of, um, you know, of manoeuvre that is, uh, comes from the fact that they have managed to dispossess Palestinians uh, in, in, in this way. Which means that, for example, if we're talking about historical experiences of apartheid, the strategy that was open to the, uh, anti to the, to the movement for liberation from apartheid inside South Africa, which was centred, I would argue, on the leading role of the black working class, the black South African working class, which was able to use the fact that the gold mines, the diamond mines, the manufacturing base of the, uh, of the South African economy relied on the labor of black South Africans, and, and that could be, they could, their withdrawal of their labor, their participation in the anti-apartheid movement um, helped shape, shape that and created the conditions for the, the breakdown of the apartheid system, um, that, that that option, if we look at the question from within the bounds of historic Palestine, is not, I would argue, a viable, uh, a viable one for, for the Palestinian movement. This raises very much the question of what, you know, can happen on a much broader scale around, um, uh, uh, around the region. The, I think it requires a reframing of perspective, so that to look at looked at it from that point of view, it can seem actually a quite a devastating one, of feeling that the that the best that Palestinians can could hope for from this kind of a, a pessimistic reading of this perspective would be that they might be able to push an opening through an undertaking, you know, very courageous and resilient forms of, uh, a, a, of minority action or of armed struggle that would help to um, redress this, you know, this imbalance of power by um, using tactics uh, such as engaging in forms of asymmetrical warfare that would create a space in which something could be negotiated to open up uh, an opportunity to create a more a, a Palestinian state, perhaps alongside the Israeli, the Israeli state, but not necessarily having the having the force to be able to overcome, dismantle, and defeat and defeat the Israeli state and get rid of settler colonialism and apartheid entirely. I would argue that I think if we turn the perspective round, though, and think about again this logic of how the way in which Palestinian dispossession has been structured into the way that, that um, uh, it's structured into the way that capitalism works in the region, we can see that there are potential hopeful avenues and, poten and potential for strategies for liberation that inter interweave the struggle of Palestinians for their own liberation with the struggles of ordinary people, of workers in particular, around the, uh, around the wider Middle East. And that's what I want to, um, to, turn, to turn to. Um, now it, 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 and try and outline how I think that could work. So I think the first point is that I talked about the kind of fragmentation of the Palestinian working class as a result of this oscillation between exclusionary and exploitive, exploitative versions of settler, of settler colonialism. But of course one of the things that this did was the exclusion of Palestinians from Palestine and their dispossession and dispersal around the region also made them made Palestinians part of the working class of many other countries in the region. 
This is a, firstly, it's important to say that this is a, a historical perspective that, you know, it, it, you, you need to look at the first decades after the Nakba to kind of see this in action in a very clear way, but it still has importance for how we understand the situation today. One of the points that I quite often will, will mention is that the, for example, the oil industries of Saudi Arabia and, the, and other countries in the Gulf would not exist without the labor of Palestinians. Palestinians were recruited by companies such as Saudi Aramco, direct from the refugee camps in Beirut. Aramco opened a recruiting office in Beirut, in the refugee camps in 1947, I think, literally within weeks of the Nakba. The um, reactionary monarchies of the Gulf were opening, their, opening the doors to a migrant labor force put, com, you know, co composed of Palestinians who were prized actually by some of these companies because they had um, you know, the relatively high levels of education for, um, um, for, for, for the region and you know, were also, as a result of the Nakba, in a position of, of, of weakness, uh, relatively speaking. Actually, of course, Palestinians who went to work in these countries were not just pliant um, workers who, you know, they, they organized themselves, they organized mass strikes, um, they resisted both exploitation and, and, and oppression. And there were long struggles by many of these countries and the oil companies to try and exclude Palestinian organizers and so on. In fact, quite a lot of the birth of the Palestinian um, nationalist movement takes place in the Gulf, partly as a result, a result of this. The points at which this, I mean, and this was also not just a question in the Gulf, you also had many, hundreds of thousands of Palestinians remain in Lebanon, Hundreds of thousands of Palestinians remain in, in Jordan, uh, and uh, in, in particular. The points at which this could be seen as opening up the gates towards a perspect, uh, you know, perspective of potential for revolutionary struggle, um, thanks. you can see uh, particularly playing out in events in Lebanon and Jordan in the late 1960s, early, early 1970s. In Lebanon, um, the struggle of Palestinians for liberation, including the development of the armed struggle and so on, took place in tandem with a radicalization across Lebanese society, which involved Palestinians working alongside, um, and, you know, with, with, uh, the, with the Lebanese, Le Lebanese left. Um, and as part of a set of social struggles and political struggles that targeted the Lebanese uh, particularly the sectarian system of government that dominated in, 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 in Lebanon. Another example is what happened in Jordan in the run-up to the events that were called the events of Black September in September 1970, where essentially you had a revolutionary crisis developed in, in Jordan, partly as a result of the interaction between the development of the Palestinian movement. Um, it's the beginnings of the guerrilla struggle that Palestinians launched against Israel and the raids of the Fedayeen movement um, and fighters into, into the West Bank and their confrontation with the Israeli state, particularly in the wake of the defeat of the conventional Arab armies of, uh, in 1960, 1967, the defeat of the Egyptian and Syrian um, armies by the Israeli state, the occupation of the, of the West Bank and, uh, uh, and Gaza. But the tragedy of both of these examples, of both the Lebanese and Jordanian examples, is that the, the leadership of the Palestinian movement at the time either um, attempted to keep the Palestinian struggle relatively separate from the struggles inside those states, or if, in the case of, as happened in the case of Jordan, only at the very last moment tried to fuse the struggle against the existing um, you know, US allied uh, sectarian in the case of Lebanon, a repressive monarchy in the case of, uh, in the case of Jordan. Um, and essentially, you know, were unable to kind of develop a strategy that would um, intensify the struggle for Palestinian liberation in tandem with the struggle to change those states. And so, uh, uh, tragically, in both cases they went down to really horrific defeats in the case of Jordan very directly with the Jordanian monarchy coming in and smashing the Palestinian armed movement and the Palestinian national movement then um, you know having to having to go to go to Lebanon 
uh, and so on. In the case of Lebanon, then becoming engaged in the Lebanese civil war um, and eventually being defeated and withdraw withdrawing in the wake of the Israeli invasion of Lebanon in, um, in, uh, 1980, in, 1980, in 1982. It's not just the case, though, that countries with large Palestinian uh, minorities in the working class, though, have, have, I think, this structural role to, that they could potentially play as laying, you know, lay, laying the basis for a revolutionary strategy in the wider region. Egypt is the other country that I want to talk about, um, I want to talk about briefly, where, again, the, the question of the liberation of Palestine is something that runs through the experience of um, ordinary people in, in Egypt. Through the, by virtue of the fact that the Egyptian state, the repressive apparatus of the, of the, of the army and the police, the whole way in fact that Egyptian capitalism is, is structured, is, has been since um, the Camp David Accords and the peace, de the peace deal that came out of it between the Egyptian, the Egyptian state and the, uh, brokered by the US and, and, and Israel. Um, you know, the, the, this, has, this has brought together the question of the liberation of Palestine with the question of how do Egyptians liberate themselves from this repressive, um, this repressive state and from the robbery of their, uh, of their labor, of uh, the natural resources of their country, uh, of the impoverishment of the vast majority of Egyptians. These, are the, these questions are all very deeply connected with the, um, with the question of um, uh, the liberation of Palestine. Because without the massive subsidies that the US gave to the Egyptian military, uh, uh, military in particular, over decades, Egypt, Egypt was for many decades the second highest recipient of US aid uh, after Israel in the world. Um, the you know, vast amounts of military uh, support and economic aid that came to the Egyptian ruling class that, that, that benefited ordinary people in, in, in Egypt, not at all, in fact left them worse off and more impoverished than they uh, um, uh, the, the, than they were previously. This is a, an example of how it is that the question of revolutionary transformation in, in Egypt and the success of a revolution from below in Egypt is, uh, is dependent uh, on taking up that question of breaking the link between the Egyptian state and the Israeli state, of stopping the Egyptian state acting as the jailer of Gaza and of a participant, a complicit participant in, currently a complicit participant in the genocide of Palestinians in, in, in Gaza. And in the last few minutes, I just want to come on to then think through what we could learn from the experience, particularly of the um, attempts to connect the, the struggle for, revolutionary struggle for liberation in Palestine, led by Palestinians, with the struggle for revolutionary change in, uh, in the wider region, in particular to look at um, the, the, the kind of tragic outcome of the revolution in Egypt in 2011-2012, and the, it, the, the failure to kind of fuse those two sides of, the revolutionary, uh, of a revolutionary struggle. I mean, it's, I think it's worth asking, what would it take for this perspective of if you, you could call it a kind of dual revolutionary perspective, that there has to be a revolutionary struggle by Palestinians inside historic Palestine, um, but it has to interact with and help to reinforce the development of revolutionary movements outside, but in neighboring, in neighboring countries. Um, I think it would mean abandoning on the Palestinian side, from the Palestinian national, national nationalist tradition and the left nationalist tradition, the idea of non-interference in other states in the in other states in the region, of seeing that the revolutionary overthrow of the states that are around Palestine is actually part and parcel of the struggle for revolution in in Palestine. And that in fact we've seen the potential for an interaction between the two sorts of struggles from, uh, for, from below, 
precisely in the run-up to the Egyptian revolution in 2011-2012. Um, the, if you talk to Egyptian activists, one of the things that they will often say to you is that if you want to understand the road that opened up to a revolution in Tahrir Square in, um, in, uh, in 2011, in February 2011, you actually have to go back to the pro-Palestine protest by school students, by students, uh, the American University in Cairo, at Cairo University, school student strikes that took place across the walkouts and so on that took place across Egypt in 2000. That that was, the, that was the, the thing that opened up the floodgates, if you like, for a generation of organizing. And there is this constant interweaving between the development of movement uh, in solidarity with the Palestinians and the, um, and the way that's fed into the development of a movement from below challenging the Egyptian state. Now, of course, and you could look here and say, well, why are the masses of Egypt not overthrowing the Egyptian state right now? Of course, it doesn't, it doesn't, there isn't an inevitability that those two, the interactions between those struggles will work out in the way that, in the way that we want. Um, there are huge uh, obstacles and barriers, including the legacy of defeats from the past, which you have to take account of. But I think that a clear perspective that saw as I said, this dual revolutionary process, a reciprocal action between mutual, mutual reinforcement, between the struggles for revolutionary perspective inside Palestine and revolutionary perspectives outside Palestine, where the people leading those movements could, on the basis of mutual, mutual respect and the sense of shared goals against a system of capitalism and imperialism, that oppresses them, uh, uh, that oppresses them both. That that really is the way in which we can talk about a road from Jerusalem to Cairo and back again. Thank you.